Hello and welcome to HBO's Crypto Corner for Wednesday, May 18th, 2022. We have a couple of things to talk about, so let's get started. First article out of the, sh out of the shoot. This legendary biologist hunted Sasquatch after he had a startling encounter of his own. John Mandzinski is a legend among American field biologists, not only for his prowess as a research scientist, but also for his stories involving Sasquatch and his unapologetic fascination with the subject. He can't really be blamed for having that kind of interest since he says he ran into the creature himself on at least one occasion. <clears throat> Mindzinski's encounter occurred in 1972 while he was camping in Wyoming's Wind River Mountains in a bacon grease stained tent on loan from the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. That night, while lying in his tent, Mindzinski was approached by what he first thought might be a bear, which had sniffed its way up alongside his tent in search of the unmistakable scent of bacon. Through his tent, Mindzinski gave what he took to be the unwelcome Ursid a gentle pop at the back of his hand, hoping he would get the message. However, after several unsuccessful attempts of getting the quote-unquote bear to leave him alone, he finally issued a firmer strike when he initially taken to be the bear's snout, only to feel his knuckles colliding with what could only have been bone, possibly a kneecap, he later thought. Suddenly, he saw the moonlit silhouette of a large human-like hand coming, over his t coming down over his tent. Whatever he had just struck fell forward, collapsing his tent. For the remainder of the evening, the quote-unquote bear proceeded to toss pine cones from off in the shadows at a rattled by Nzinski, who built a fire and anxiously listened to it moving around in the nearby brush. Later, he reported the incident to the Department of Game and Fish, which, to his surprise, led to his discovery that several of his co-workers had either shared an interest in the subject or even had experiences themselves. There were a lot of people in the Game and Fish Department that were interested, Mindziski recently recalled of his years working in Wyoming during an interview. People that I knew and worked with and drank beer with after work were very interested in these stories of a hairy, hairy primate in the Wind River Mountains and other places in Wyoming, which included reported sightings in the Yellowstone National Park that have occasionally occurred over the years. All these sightings were coming in now that I was tapping into that resource, Mindzinski said, so I could get these sightings kind of funneled into me to investigate. Mindzinski said he was hearing several stories from reservations where he said the indigenous American residents often wouldn't share their accounts, although today he says now they do, so I get reports all the time. On one occasion, Mindzinski says that a hair sample was obtained, which he turned over to the Wyoming Game and Fish Department's lab for analysis. To the surprise of those in the lab who studied it, the sample in question appeared to be a match for some kind of primate. Exactly what primate that was, however, was another question. After we found out that it came back as a primate hair, but not a known primate, Mindzinski recalls, I wasn't particularly quiet about it. I thought this was the most interesting wildlife project I've ever heard of, yet nobody can get any funding to study it. It's not going to get studied unless I do it personally, Mindzinski remembers thinking. That would have been his plan, that is, if his superiors hadn't caught wind of the odd discovery first. The head of the research division for the Game and Fish Department called us into the lab after we heard he had, after he heard we had analyzed this sample, because word spreads by word of mouth. As Mindzinski recalls, he wanted all of us that were involved in that, the head veterinarian, Tom Thorne, and myself, and the forensic veterinarian who actually looked at the hair under the microscope and was the first one to identify it as primate hair. The response from his superior had not been the warm reception Mindzinski might have hoped for. We got chewed out, Mindzinski says. He told us to be there at a certain time, and we were all sitting on a bench lab 
on a lamp bench waiting for him to show up and joking, wondering what he wanted to see us about. He just started coming in red-faced, Bindisky recalled, and he said, if I ever hear any of you connected with the name Bigfoot, you don't even have to utter it. If your name is connected with the name Bigfoot any time in the future, I'm going to see to it personally that you're fired one way or another. Bindisky said that the other two employees that were called in with him and given the same warning had gone quiet. And although they still went to Bigfoot-related events and conferences and pursued their interests, they no longer openly expressed whether that they did so. The same couldn't be said for Mindzinski, however, who felt that his superior had presented an ultimatum that he just couldn't get behind. I was more vocal, and just I just decided I really couldn't work for an agency that doesn't honor science enough to study the most interesting science phenomena to come along. Although for many biologists, this might have signaled the end of their fascination with a taboo sub topic like Sasquatch, Fortunately, Mindzinski continued his studies after leaving the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, although that in itself has presented its challenges over the years. I think I've come to a place where I can deal with it, Mindzinski says, admitting that he doesn't like doing many conferences and speaking appearances. There are certain things I won't talk about, he says, referencing various members of tribal groups that have confined their personal stories to him, although one thing remains consistent among these indigenous American traditions. Since the earliest arrivals of humans in the Americas, there have been traditions involving Sasquatch. Sasquatch was already there, Mindziski says, echoing members of indigenous American tribes who have shared the stories and traditions with him. They were here when people first arrived, Mindziski says. Today, several decades after his superior had once tried to silence his Sasquatch interests, John Mindziski's interest is still strong, and he remains involved in the pursuit of knowledge about what he believes to be America's most famous and yet reclusive giant primate. Very interesting article. And it's not surprising that his superiors would crack down on him, or would have cracked down on him about discussing Sasquatch Bigfoot, They don't like to discuss that kind of thing, obviously. They probably feel it's embarrassing. So therefore, they don't want to talk about it, and they don't want to hear about it. Fortunately, Mindziski did not take to heart the advice of his superiors. I mean, and in fact, I mean, when he was no longer under the auspices of the Game and Fish Commission, he could talk about it as he pleased. Well, he would have probably talked about it anyway, even if he was still working for them. So good on John Mindzinski. And we have a passing to note. Jim McCullough Jr. passes away. Now, you may be wondering... Who's Jim McCullough Jr.? Well, I'm going to tell you. Jim McCullough Jr. passed away during the morning of May 11, 2022 after battling some health issues. Jim McCullough Jr. was a writer and producer known for Brooklyn's Finest, The Aurora Encounter, and Mountaintop Motel Massacre. Brooklyn's Finest 2009, The Aurora Encounter 1986, and Mountain Motel Massacre 1983. McCullough Jr. wrote, produced, and worked on the soundtrack of Creature from Black Lake. He also acted as Orville Bridges in the movie. Creature from Black Lake is a 1976 American independent horror film written and directed by Joy N. Halk Jr. and starring Jack Elam, Dub Taylor, Dennis Fimple, John David Carson, and Bill Thurman. After hearing a lecture on unknown humanoid creatures such as Bigfoot and the Falk Monster, two college students decide to spend their breaks pursuing the story and journey to the Louisiana-Arkansas border. There they begin interviewing witnesses, ranging from a family that suffered a car crash when the creature menaced them on the road to a backwoods fisherman whose friend was pulled out of a boat and killed. Eventually, the creature begins stalking, stalking them, which leads to a confrontation in the dark of the swamps at night. 
I once gave a lecture at the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Festival about Creature from Black Lake, detailing the internal conflict between a non-kill Bigfoot hunter and a pro-kill Bigfoot seeker in the movie. The anti-kill researcher was a Vietnam veteran. It was an intriguing twist on expectations. The Aurora Encounter is a 1986 American science fiction western film directed by Jim McCullough Sr., Written by Melody Brooke and Jim McCullough Jr., starring Jack Elam, Mickey Hayes, Peter Brown, Carol Bagnasarian, and Donnie West. Now, is that Donnie West, the country music singer? That's interesting. I didn't realize she was an actress. This plot follows the residents of a small Texas town at the turn of the 20th century who are visited by an alien being after a UFO crashes in their town. Screenplay was based on the Aurora, Texas UFO incident, which allegedly occurred in 1897. Mickey Hayes, who was cast in the film in the role of the alien, suffered from progeria that gave him an unusual appearance. <coughs> Director Jim McCullough Sr. remained close with Hayes after the production until Hayes' death at age 20 in 1992. The Make-A-Wish Foundation helped in the casting of Hayes, whose wish was to be in the Hollywood movie. Jim Jr.'s father, James McCullough Sr., May 12, 1928, April 6, 2012, was an American film director and producer who wrote and directed several horror films in the 1980s. Charles Pierce, the director of The Legend of Boggy Creek, acted in the Aurora Encounters as the preacher. Charles Bryant Pierce, June 16, 1938 to March 5, 2010, was the American film director, screenwriter, producer, set decorator, cinematographer, and actor. Pierce directed 13 films over the, over the span of 26 years, with best known for his cult hits, Legend of Boggy Creek, I should say 1972-1973, and The Town of the Dreaded Sundown, 1976. An Arkansas resident for most of his life, Pierce made his directorial debut with Boggy Creek, a, foul, a faux documentary-style film inspired by the legend of the Bigfoot-like Falk Monster. Pierce followed that with several inexpensive regional films set in the southern United States, including The Town of the Dread Sundown, based on the true story of the Phantom Killer murders in Texarkana. Thanks for the alert from Craig Woolhear. So, rest in peace, Jim McCullough, Jr. And um, we enjoyed your movie. We enjoyed you in the movie as well, as Orville. And may his, may his family be comforted at this time. And that's going to do it for this week. I want to thank you very much for tuning in. You guys are on the heart of the show. I always say that, but I always mean it. And I'll continue to do this as long as you guys want me to. And hey, until next week, y'all be good or be good at this HBM's Crypto Corner.